Ronnie and I are working on a project called Opening Educational Practices in Scotland, which that's the first and only time I'm going to say it because it's quite a mouthful. And what we're going to try and do is just unpick a bit of what lies behind the project and, and why we think it's in, important. And it's, it's unusual, I think, because it's a project that's led by the Open University in Scotland as part of its outcome agreement with the Scottish Funding Council. But most of the objectives in the project are not about objectives for the Open University, that the Open University has to do this or that for itself, but it's about objectives for the HE sector in particular in, in Scotland. And so we've been tasked to work with uh, partners across the whole sector both within conventional HE and also a very eclectic range of other organisations that universities and colleges might find themselves working with as well. And currently, um, we've got active engagement with about 50 different organisations, which range from a majority now of the universities in Scotland, some colleges, college development network, but also third sector organisations, employers, one football club, um, and... Uh, you know, really quite a wide range of things, and we'll try and explain what that's all about in, as, as, as we go. And so the first thing is, is what the project is about and what it's not about. We, we're working with uh, the idea that uh, in the modern world there's a very large amount of often, but not always, quite high quality open educational material available online in a range of different places, repositories, and, and so on. And much of that material is in the form of what's technically called open educational resources and comes with uh, you know, a number of attributes, really. First of all, it's, it's free, so there's no cost involved in using it. But probably more importantly, the nature of the license that goes with it. Okay, so these things are... Creatively Commons license, and if you go to the Creative Commons website, you'll find that there's a range of different Creative Commons licenses, but and they allow slightly different variations on the kind of freedoms that go with using these resources. But uh, rather than going into the detail of that, the important thing is, is that they, they're often described as enabling five the five what people call the five R's. Okay, so you can reuse the resources without constraint. You can you can revise them. You can remix them, different things together to make, make new material. You can redistribute, and, and, you can, and you can hold on to them. You can retain, retain them as well. Now, I, I suppose the question I have, uh, really, for, just for people around the room is, um, are any of you actually actively using open educational resources that, in, in, in that way as part of your practice at the moment? Small group to the left, <laughs> and, uh, um, and uh, one of the things that's really quite interesting, I think, is worldwide there is a great deal of interest in the use of open educational resources, although it does have different characteristics in different places. So in the global south and in the United States, actually it's probably much more about open textbooks rather than... Um, than open educational resources in the form of courses. Um, and the open textbook movement in the United States is really interesting. If you're not aware of that, it's definitely worth looking at some of the material that's being produced, some really, really good quality material that's being produced in free, open form. Uh, very important in countries where textbooks are just beyond the reach of a lot of people. So, uh, uh, and that's true, actually, in the United States as well, where the cost of textbooks have been very, very high, and it's been a major barrier to, uh, to student engagement. Um, the thing that we're going to talk about in a minute, which might be one of the things, the word that probably most of you will have come across, is, is the idea of MOOCs, ma Massive on Open Online Courses. And it's interesting, actually, because, uh, again, just a quick question. How many people here have actually uh, studied a MOOC, either on FutureLearn or Coursera, edX, or what? Quite, quite a lot. Okay. Um, now, uh, 
One of the things we've found in the project is that when we talk about open education, people often think, oh, you mean MOOCs. Well, MOOCs are part of the landscape, but actually only possibly quite a small part of the landscape. And interestingly, they're definitely not, or not normally, open educational resources. So the, the, the MOOCs that are distributed by FutureLearn, for example, are not actually available for reuse by educators, typically. Although some of the institutions that put things up on FutureLearn do then shift that educational content to other platforms where it can be reused, but that's not always the case. And you know, it's not possible for you to take the material and revise and remix, because actually if you look at you know, a typical page, it's actually copyright, okay? So there are restrictions on, on what you can, can do with it. It's the same as there would be with a, you know, a, a book from the library or something like, something like that. So we're going to talk about MOOCs because it actually opens up quite a lot of interesting things around this, but, it, but they're not the entirety of what, what we're interested in. Okay, now just, just to say something about the project, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to stop quite soon and allow uh, Ronnie to come in, but then come back with a bit more about the project towards the end. But really what the challenge of the project and what we've been tasked to do is so there's, a, there's, a, there's a promise that people write about with open education. And if you look at some of the literature around open education, uh, there's been a great deal written about it. The idea that you've got free access to high quality educational materials on a mass scale is something which has really excited people. And, and has led to the idea that this could break down barriers of access to, to education, actually change some of the, the boundaries of higher education and make it easier for people that have traditionally found it difficult to engage, to engage with, with higher education. So that's the promise, in a sense. And you can see why people might expect that, because particularly with the, the, the increasing ubiquity of digital devices, uh, it, it's much easier to access these kind of materials. But there is, a, there is a serious but at the moment. The challenge is, if you look at the who actually uses these resources at the moment, it's true of MOOCs, but it's also true, I think, certainly in Europe, uh, of uh, open educational resources more generally, that those that actually use them are, generally speaking, those who have already had access to higher education already. So with MOOCs, typically, most of the platforms find about 70% of people, you, people even signing up, uh, have already got degrees, often postgraduate degrees as well. So you could, in a broad brush kind of way, say that what so far open education is doing in, in, in certainly in, in Europe is to kind of give more to those who already have had, had quite a lot from the, from the, from the system, and, but not actually open, 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 opening up possibility for others. Okay, and, and so where did this project come from, just before I stop? One, one of the, my background is not in educational technology at all. I mean, I spent the last uh, decade or more primarily working around widening participation and, and work-based learning. And one really interesting thing, I think, when the, uh, I'm not exactly sure when it started, but around about 2007, 2008, the, the OU had launched its uh, Open Learn platform for free open educational resources. There was uh, lots of publicity around uh, MIT's Open Courseware Initiative. And some of the people I, I talked to in my widening participation work, people in um, third sector organizations and employers and so on, actually would uh, typically would ask questions like, you know, heard, read, read something about this open learn stuff. It can't really be true that it's free, can it? Um, and they'd start from the money thing, really. And you'd say, well, actually, yes, it is. And explain a bit about what kind of material is there. And six months or a year later, you go back and actually find that most, mostly nothing had happened, actually. People got very excited, but then nothing happened. Uh, but at the same time, in a very small number of cases, uh, we started working in partnership to develop some new resources where partners we had, and they were quite wide-ranging. They ranged from... Uh, organization working with refugees and migrant workers in Glasgow, Community Energy Scotland, a number of other organizations, actually had gaps in the resources available to them. 
And we started creating OER, new, short new pieces of free courses with them to, um, uh, to, to fill in a gap for their, their needs and the needs of their, their clients. And interestingly, what we found was that we started getting kind of MOOC scale participation from grassroots development. So we would work with one organization, but we'd find that their needs were very similar to their sister organizations around Scotland, and then the case of the refugee organization in, in Europe as well. And we ended up with hundreds and thousands of people studying courses which had been developed in partnership. And, and what that led us to start thinking was that it wasn't so much about the content. The content was already there. There's masses of it out there, actually. One of the problems is actually find, you know, just finding a way through, through all of it. But actually, it was about the educational practice and pedagogy that you put together with the content to enable people to use it. And that really is what the project's about, actually. It's about it's called OEPPS for a reason. It's not about resources. It's about the practices. And, and we, we are, we're tasked, really, to enable people to use open education more widely in Scotland, but th through thinking really hard about what uh, educators do in terms of practice to, to use them. I think that's um, almost where I'm going to stop. And so I suppose a hypothesis we have is that um, if we can do some of these things, some of it may actually require uh, some rethinking of conventional boundaries between uh, what educators do, the boundaries between institutional boundaries, boundaries and practice boundaries. One of the things I find quite exciting is I think it pushes back the, the, the role of the, the, the teacher and the role of pedagogy in terms of what we do. It actually puts that right, right back up because actually, if content is kind of ubiquitous, what is it that HE does? It's not, it's not about just stuff. It's about how we teach, understanding how students learn, understanding the ways of putting students and material together that, that's really, really important. So that's, that's just a kind of whirlwind introduction. The next section is going to be much more participative, and we want to just spend a little bit of time thinking about MOOCs before we come back to some of the things that we can, that we are doing and possibly can do in, in the project before this hour. So I'll hand over to Ronnie. Thank you. I'm Ronnie. <coughs> yeah, so as Pete said, I think in the early stages of the open education movement, there was an open education resource movement, there was a great deal of focus on how to enable openness. And those were important things to consider around how the license and how the technology enables openness. I think as it's matured, there's a recognition that we also need to consider what exactly openness might enable us as educators to do. And uh, this is, I'm just going to sort of run a sort of couple of little short interactive exercises that will hopefully facilitate some group discussion about those sort of big acronyms like MOOCs and so on. With the so the background being around what is the what is the promise of open education? What promises do we make with that? So the first thing I'd like us to do is actually having heard a little bit from Pete about what a MOOC is and what the um, and what the letters stand for. Um, I thought I'd ask people to sort of just turn around to someone sitting beside them and spend two or three minutes uh, talking about what they think the most important enabling letter in MOOC is. Is it the M for massive? Some people would argue that the most important thing about a MOOC is that it's large. So if I work on educational technology scale and having thousands of learners doing something allows me to do things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do, like engage in peer reflections, participatory activities and forums. If I'm a senior manager at university, I might also think that massive is pretty important as well because they may, the, the more people we, you know, it's about the reach of the university itself. Is it one of the O's? Is it the O for open? Is the most crucial thing about MOOCs the openness, the fact that they are free for and open for anyone to study? So as Pete said, there's some 
issues about how open some of them are. Is it the online? Is that the, is that the most important factor? Or is it the C for course? In the early part of the open education movement in the UK, there was a tendency to create open and licensed content that were discrete objects. And the reason that MOOCs have swept through is because MOOCs are a course. They have a start date, they have an end date, they have a cohort moving through together. Uh, it was easy. And that has been important for, um, for the uptake of them because people sort of see that they have a start. So I want you just to talk about what you think the most important enabling letter in MOOC is. Just two or three minutes, and then I'm just going to ask random people in the audience to say what they think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hands up for M. Oh, come on. Hands up for M. M. Why M? I put M for potential in a global context. So you look at what education and online is all about, which is the ability to get education students who don't have the opportunity to go to school. Okay. What about the first of the O's? Hands up for that. One, two, cluster. Why? Tended to be shared by photocopies and so on. Okay. It was free Creative Commons license before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> what about the next though? Hands up for the online. Okay, why, why the online? Yeah. Yeah. So you can actually, as a self directed learner, you can take a whole bunch of online materials and actually create your own learning journey. What about the C? Hands up for the C. <laughs> I haven't picked anyone on that side of the room, you see. Of course. course is important. I mean, not everybody is, is confident enough to be a self-regulated learner uh, who has those independent study skills. They, they might need that structure, especially in an open online world as well. So that was really useful um, in terms of, but I'm going to tell you which one I pick. Yeah? I'm going to pick O for open. You know? <laughs> Because I work for the Open University, and it's in our name, so I, I kind of I feel obliged to. Um, but what does that actually mean? What does what does Open in Open University mean? As I've become in doctor, you know, I've worked for other universities in Scotland before, but I worked for the OU for about a decade and slowly becoming indoctrinated into sort of its way of thinking about education, uh, an internalised strap line. Um, open to uh, people, places, methods, and idea. So, what does that open mean? That means no need for previous educational qualifications. And that says that's, that actually has design implications. If you're actually going to create higher education level learning that is truly open, regardless of where you are in the educational journey, you need to really think very carefully 
but the pedagogical design of those open resources. Because you cannot assume any previous education qualifications. And maybe there's a question there about, about why it is that many of the people who are actually studying a lot of these open courses are the education has a lot of confidence. So maybe there's some questions there about whether, they were, whether actually the openness is simply about the license, or there's actually things that we need to think about in terms of what open means in terms of the types of materials we design, the types of content we offer, and the structure of those learning journeys. Uh, open to places, methods, ideas. Increasing use of online and other methods. And as a consequence, it means scale and significant numbers of widening participation in students' plan. Let, let's hope. Let's hope. So that's, I picked that one. And that's the reasons that I, that I picked it. And those are the things that I think about when I'm, when I'm thinking about the over open. And as I think people pointed out, actually it's quite hard to disaggregate the different elements of the book because they actually overlap with each other as well. And I think that O works on promises. And uh, it's quite, this, is this, this is part of the business school, isn't it? In here. So it's quite good because actually this is based on this idea of thinking about the promises that we make in open education is actually based on the work of Philip Kotler, some sort of marketing, marketing guru. He writes a lot of that. textbooks and marketing. And he asks us to think about the promises that we make and how we enable them. And I think that the way that we enable openness is the design of our materials and recognizing that everybody is in a different place in their learning journey. And the need to understand that people will need support and guidance along that learning journey, particular less certain learners. And I think there's an interesting promise that open universities across the globe make as well as sort of saying we'll design those materials in the way that support you, that, that we will provide people to support you on that learning journey. And the third promise, that for those people who are the educational have-nots and have no qualifications, it's really important that when you learn, we will recognize that learning. And, we'll, and you can get credit for it. Because for those people who have no credit, doing something that doesn't have credit Seem, there seems to be a bit of a social justice issue there. So, I, so what, comparing the open universities to the open education movement, I think we might be missing a promise in terms of how we recognize learning. So, and I suppose then I'm going to break into groups again to actually sort of think about what it is what those promises are and what we think that we might enable by being more open in our educational plan. What promises we might want to make and how we might enable those promises. And to think about those promises about to design materials that are open, to support people, and whether the promise of recognition is important as well. Are they, you know, as I, as I say in Animal Farm, are they all equal or are some more equal? So, and I think that this is a question, which is a sort of, uh, there's a woman, Diane Lorillard, who's what some people might be familiar with. She's, she's director of the Institute of Education. Yeah. Um, and what she says is, um, if MOOCs are the solution, what was the problem in the first place? And, you know, so what is it we're trying to enable? And what promises might, might we make for them? So I'd like you to just, Go into groups, uh, maybe sort of turn around in groups and actually talk about what it is that you, what is, what was the problem in the first place and what do you think MOOCs might enable you to do as educators or being open for change. Does that make sense? Sort of. Hello. Uh, obviously this is stimulating lots of discussion. So, I'm just going to just get some 
general, if people want to make any general points, I won't pick on anyone this time. Looking for volunteers. Um, to sort of give us a summary of the kind of questions that you were discussing in terms of actually what it is that you think that engaging and developing a MOOC or an open educational resource might enable you as an educator? And what kind of promises that you might be making to your learners? As Pete and I and have been going around visiting different education providers from schools to colleges to higher education. I think that theme of those in-between spaces where the curriculum sometimes doesn't fill um, and those transitions, those gaps um, where people just need something, whether they're articulated from college into university or whether they're going to school to HE and making sure that they make the right choices. We're hearing a lot from the sector about open education and MOOCs not as a replacement, but as a complement, something that actually helps universities fill some of those. I mean, and we, we know there's, you know there's big problems about making incorrect course choices and ending up on the wrong course. And there's huge financial costs to education providers of student ending up in the wrong place. So, and we're hearing that a lot, you know, around small bits of learning, structured learning, that allow people to make the right choices. And also that other bit, I think there's, I was at the Learning for All conference last week, I mean, talking about the attainment gap and sort of social and cultural capital that some people have that allows them to benefit from higher education more than many working class people do. And it sort of got me thinking, and, you know, which is I think the point you were making about the role of open education in actually providing and enhancing the learning experience for, for, for less certain learners as well. So thank you. So uh, thank you everybody for, for uh, discussing that. I'm going to hand back over to Pete now. Okay. Um, one of the problems with talking about open education is the moment you start, you open up all kinds of spaces to talk about. So it's, it's about how you teach, how people learn, what the financial models are, there's all kinds of different things we could talk about. And in the 10 minutes or so that I've got left, I can't cover all of that. But I thought what I might do is just give one or two tasters of some of the things that we are doing with partners in the project, just perhaps to give you food for thought for after today, the things you might want to pick up on. And actually probably one of the things I should say is that it, you know, so at the beginning, books is a cross-sector project, and we, are, in the first instance, we're around for three years. We've been going for about ten months now. We've got two, two of the years left. We're hoping it might be considered a, an activity that's worth doing for a lot for longer than that. But you know, that's where we are at the moment. And we are, you know, if either you know, Abate is a university or any group within Abate wanted some, you know, some more, some more help or advice from some of the experience that we can share. We put, we try and put everything we find on our website, but also we're very happy to, to come and come and help as well. That's, you know, that's basically what we've been paid for. So we should be doing it. <laughs> um, and we shouldn't feel like we can't ask. Uh, right. Okay. Um, so you know, behind all this is this the idea that that. Educational practice, I think a lot of people who've talked about educational practice in the past have tended to think about it as about how you design the online material. And that absolutely is important. You need to be thinking about who the students are and how they're going to use the material when you do it. But one of the things that we think is worth also thinking about is not just the, the content, the material itself, but the world in which it's going to be used. And so a lot of it is about the... Uh, the social models of learning. Who are the students and what, what are the context they're going to use it in and where are the possibilities for peer support and where are the possibilities for encouragement and where might they be going next? That's, you know, those, those questions and observations about transitions are really, really important because that's a key part, actually, I think, of most people's engagement with education. Usually when you're learning, you're moving, going from somewhere to somewhere, somewhere else. 
So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, 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 on this slide, but you might want to look at it again later. Um, I, we've, we've been learning lots, and there's some reports that we've written now that you can, you can access through, through the website. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe come back to some, some of those things in a minute rather than dwelling on them at the, mo the moment. I suppose it gives you concrete examples to make this not an abstract thing. But there's three or four different kinds of things we found ourselves doing with, with partners. One of them is where the, u the university or university education kind of comes up against some other kind of organization. Um, and there's a need for some new content. We've got many more examples than this, but I'll give you three, three that are a bit diverse. Uh, we've been working with um, Parkinson's UK, which is the organization which concerns itself with knowledge and education about Parkinson's disease. It's an interesting area because it tends not to form a mainstream part of most medical education. It's also a situation where lots of people, low paid people working in care homes, for example, come across people with Parkinson's and need to know about it too. So what, one of the things that Parkinson's UK does is do face-to-face um, -face workshops with groups of health professionals, care assistants and so on around the UK. Uh, and we've been doing that for quite a long time. We've got some great hard copy resources they use, really well written. Uh, but actually the demand for what they do is way beyond what they can actually, actually meet. So what we're doing with them is in part taking the hard copy resources and turning them into an open educational resource, an online course. But actually the more interesting thing we'll be doing with them as well is thinking about how that material then gets used in the circumstances which they're using. And this is not a few learners potentially. There are, you know, the, the, the people who are the audience for this course are in their hundreds of thousands. So, you know, they're, and, uh, and there are about 60,000 people each year with Parkinson's disease in the UK, but many more people who actually work with them. So, so there's a whole lot of interesting things around that. So that's, the online content didn't exist. So we're helping it be created, but it's actually, we could create some perfect online content and it might just sit there and never get used. There's an awful lot material that sits there and doesn't get used. So the really interesting thing is about the usage of it. So the pedagogy of use, not just the pedagogy of how you create content. Completely different one, although it isn't actually in, kind of in the health area as well. We're working with the, the, the Glasgow University that's down in the Crichton campus in Dumfries. And Professor David Clark down there is a world expert in end-of-life care. Uh, he has his own network. He's quite interesting because he's one of these people who was kind of not very keen on social media or anything online until relatively recently. And he was pushed, I think, into starting writing a blog to share some of, some of his work. And he's ended up with about 7,000 followers of, a, of, of his blog, all internationally. Uh, put him in contact with all kinds of people he didn't know before. Um, and the, his group has got a, a welcome foundation grant for the next three or four years, and part of it is about public education. And what they want to do is get some of the cutting edge research about end of life care out to a much wider audience. And so again, partly what we're doing, that content doesn't currently exist, except in a face-to-face -face course which has been delivered to about 20 students in Dumfries. Their aspirations are to get it out to tens of thousands of people around the world. So the OER is partly about that. But there's some other really interesting things around communities of practice. One of the groups that he's in now close contact with is there's two and a half thousand healthcare workers in Kerala, for example, who are kind of keep on bombarding with emails saying, when is your OER going to be ready? Because we need that as part of our course. But uh, you know, there's a community there that needs it, and we'll discuss it. But the important thing is it also feeds back into scholarship and research because this isn't a one-way process. Through the combination of the OER plus the network plus social media, the, the research team in Dumfries is actually getting lots of input in the other direction as well from uh, people engaged in that work around, around the world. So you know, their, their open education is enabling a whole lot of other things besides uh, uh, simply uh, 
I'm also working with the Quake, which is the organization in Scotland that uh, looks at supporting women in science and technology. And there, what we're developing is a, is a new bit of material which supports transitions, but then actually, again, the interesting thing is how does that material live in the world that Equate works in? They've got lots of interesting practice already, some of which, which is really relevant to how you use the OER, some of which they need to develop further if it's going to be really effective. So that's one example. Completely different one, though, and in many ways this is more typical. There's an awful lot of good material out there already. People, I, one of the things um, so many people have said to me is that they look at sites like Open Learn or Durham, and they're just overwhelmed by how much there is there. And actually, if generally people have full lives anyway. They don't have lots of spare time for thinking, among these several thousand different courses, which is the one that really works for me, unless you've got recommendations from something who's already using it. Um, so one of the questions is about how do you engage people with OER? And we're working with a number of different organizations around supporting people into those first steps. You know, it's not helpful to say, there's all that stuff, just go and find what you need. It's actually about starting places, it's about curation, choosing the right places to start in context for a given group, and then also thinking about the where next questions as well. So if you successfully do one thing, what would you, what would you do next? And we're creating a, an online hub that, that, that will be for practice, not for new material, <coughs> that will help people to do that and support communities of people to do that. But uh, one of the examples that we're working with Scottish Union Learning, they have networks of union learning reps in workplaces all over Scotland. Their job is to support their colleagues to get into education, but they're relatively unsupported in doing it. All of, most of the ones we come across know about OER, they know about the sites, they find it really hard to use. So what we're doing is uh, providing them with support and training to actually uh, do, do that job better. Um, there's a lot of interest, uh, Ronald mentioned about um, kind of recognition for what you do. There's lots of interest around badging, which is perhaps worth following up. But, um, and as part of the project, and some of the new OER we've created for specific purposes, some of that now is, uh, is badged online resources. So you, you end up with an electronic badge that looks like if you were ever in the, the cubs or the scouts or the brownies, the kind of thing that you used to, but I think actually they've just, the guy that actually stopped doing that, you used to sew onto your sleeve, but actually I think now they, they may be sick on or, um, but they look like that, but actually they're electronic, and they embed the data about what it was you did, how the, what the assessment was, and so on. It's an interesting idea, it's being used in, by some employers now, it's not being used much in the university sector. I think the five badges that we have with the OU in Scotland, through the resources we've been created, in connection to the project, are probably the only ones that op operating in the university sector at any scale. But they are being taken up by both students and employers quite significantly. Um, talk to you about that. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to go back to the badges. So I've just re remembered that there's an important thing about the badges. Um, I just want to give you one example just to give you a there's a weak card here on one side that tells you details about the project, and do feel free to take the numbers. On the back, because we have got something on the back as well, so it's a waste of paper. We've also put some information about some new open educational resources the Open Universities created. Now, this is not a selling pitch for these, these courses, it's an example. The, these new courses are access courses into a range of different disciplines. So they're online courses, short courses to help people make that transition from informal education to you know, starting a first year uh, course at the And so they've developed both subject skills but also learning, learning skills as well. Now, they were written in the OU context. I think the material is actually quite good because they built on a whole lot of some paid for and accredited courses that came, came before them. But, Actually, one of the things we're really interested in is how do they live in a world where uh, the traditional thing, really, if your university wanted something like that, you'd 
just finishing. Uh, we, we, you, would, you would have had to do it yourself. And, and people reinvent the wheel many, many times over. And I know some of this material, you'll look at it and think, that's very similar to things that we've used in the past as well. But actually, in the new world, um, you know, that content may be almost what you, what you need. It's perfectly possible for you to use that material as it is without making any changes at all. But because it's OER, you could, uh, if you're looking at making bridges for people to get into Avatar, you might think actually having something that says Open University on top isn't the best way to get somebody into Avatar. No problem. You can just change it. Change the heading. Reversion. But actually reversing not by spending many weeks or months of staff time in changing the resources, just change the heading and use it. That's what you can do with OER. But maybe you think actually for students in Dundee, with the kind of background that you're, you're thinking about, actually it doesn't quite work. The examples are wrong, or the case studies are wrong, or something like that. But change the case study. <coughs> you can use it. So, you know, some, of, some of the examples of things we've done in the past, we started with one thing, and it's transformed itself by a series of iterations into a different course. But at relatively low cost. The first, I'm not arguing that this is, this, this is very low cost, because initially creating material costs money. You know, so this is not... You have to find that resource somewhere. But actually, reversioning can, of, can often be a relatively low cost and low labor intensive thing to produce material that would be what you really need, actually. So there, there, are, there is options for using material through reversioning. It doesn't happen very much at the moment, actually. But I think it will in the future. And, and it raises a whole lot of questions around you know, ownership, confidence in using things. Whether you know, There's lots of surveys around that say, by and large, academics think sharing is really good if you're sharing other people's stuff. It's not so good if you're sharing your own, actually. I mean, the huge discrepancies in the research, and, and you, know, you can understand why, why that's the case. But actually, the potential for doing that and doing it with a kind of high quality is, is, is much greater than it ever, ever was. And so if you want to have a look at those, do, do take one of those cards uh, that I've sent. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.